Hello everyone, I'm Becky Goldsmith and this is Birds in Toyland. It is a wonderful, festive holiday quilt. I do believe you're going to smile as you make every single one of these blocks. Inside the book, there are instructions for both needle turn hand applique and wool hand applique, plus more instructions for um, some embroidery and for embellishing. But one of the things I think you might like to see a little closer is how I sewed the bird beaks. You have a variety of options, but I think the easiest way to handle these little tiny pieces is to use felted wool. Let me show you. I love this particular bird block. I think he looks just a little bit like a punk rocker that bird does. <laughs> Isn't he cute with his little top knot? Um, but he also has a very small beak. The beak is number 15. When you see it drawn on the block, it doesn't look quite as small as it does when you hold the template in your hand. It is really very tiny. I have already made my templates as I describe how to do in the book. I've already made my placement overlay. Now I can set this aside and show you how I get that bird beak completed in felted wool. You don't have to, but I really like to use soft fuse on the underside of my wool applique. It helps to hold the shapes in place. And this is a really light fusible web. I haven't found another one that works as well as this one. And on shapes this small, fusible web is a little easier to use than a glue stick because glue sticks pull and might cause the piece to fray. And it's small enough as it is, you don't want it to fray. This tells you to use no steam and a cool iron. Most irons don't tell you how hot they get. So set it at one of the coolest settings, that um, wool setting, the wool and silk, I think. Use that. And then it tells you to only press for three to five seconds. It means it. Don't overcook your fusible web. Now, it doesn't say on the instructions but I always recommend using a Teflon pressing sheet. And I like to use it both below the wool and on top of the fusible web. It not only protects the iron, but I believe it helps to diffuse the heat better. I have already traced the template on the paper side of a small piece of fusible web. Now when you trace, Make sure that you turn the template upside down because the paper side of the fusible web corresponds to the wrong side of your fabric. So you always turn your templates right side down when you're tracing onto the paper. When you use fusible web, always leave a buffer of the paper in the fusible around the outer edges of the shape. That way, once you get this fused and you cut it out, you'll be sure that there's fusible all the way to the edge of the wool. This is the piece of fusible wool I'm going to use. I've already cut it to fit my small piece of fusible web. This is a hand-dyed piece of wool. The two sides are a little bit different from each other. This side is a little bit darker than this side. For this demonstration, I don't really care which side is up. But if I was putting this on my block, I might care. Know that either side can be the right side. You get to choose. I believe I'm going to use the light side as the right side. And I will place my fusible web on this side. I'm going to take my goddess pressing sheet to my ironing board. I will place this on top of the sheet and then I'm going to fold 
the goddess sheet back over it, making a sandwich. I'm going to use my pretty cool iron on top of the fusible web, and I'm going to do a slow count. One, two, three. Then I will lift this up, let that cool, double check it to make sure it's stuck, and then I'll cut the beaks out. I'll be back and show you how I do that. I'm back and I've got my fusible web pressed to the wool. It's cooled off and I can test it and see that yes, the paper pulls free and it leaves the fusible web attached to the wool. I have two of the same beak drawn on here. I only need to cut out one. Really, I didn't need to draw both of them. I just did. I want to use my scissors to carefully cut this out. And think about how you're cutting when you cut this because wool is thick. Keep your scissors straight up and down to the wool. Try not to let them lay over on the side because you want a nice crisp vertical edge at the edge of the wool. You don't want to grade it so that it's thicker on one side of the cut than the other. If I wasn't working under the camera, I would be doing this on my wool pressing mat that's over on my ironing board, but my camera doesn't reach that far. So I'm doing this on a small portable pressing mat. I've laid the goddess Teflon sheet over the wool mat. I've placed a background block on top of the Teflon. Now I want to position my placement overlay over the background fabric. The beak is number 15. Really, there should be 14 pieces already appliqued to this block. I'm not doing that because I want you to focus all your attention on the beak and if all those other pieces are on there it's distracting. So that's why I'm doing this out of sequence. But to position any of the shapes I wanted to show you that you place the positioning overlay over the background block. There are horizontal and vertical center lines that match up drawn onto the overlay and pressed into the background grid and all of these instructions are in the book. Hold that there. I have already peeled the little piece of paper off the back of number 15. I'm going to reach underneath and get that mostly in position. And then because they are handy, I'm going to use the point of my scissors to move the little beak into position. The positioning can move around just a little bit and it changes the expression of the birds. It's really fun to watch. The beaks and the placement of the eyes give these birds so much more personality than you can even imagine. It's really fun to see their little to see their little faces start shining through. So I'm going to carefully remove the overlay. While I hold the beak in place, I'm going to fold my goddess sheet carefully over it. And then I'm going to take this over to my warm iron and press it. I did look closer at my iron. The correct setting for the temperature on my iron is in the middle of the heat dial. It is the wool silk setting. Know that that's going to vary from iron to iron because irons are not calibrated in a particularly scientific way. So try it with your own iron and find the right setting and then stick with it. I will Hold the iron in place on top of the goddess sheet and count to eight slowly. Then I'm going to open this up, kind of double check it, see how it's sticking. If it's pretty good, I'm going to then peel back the goddess sheet, turn the fabric 
wrong side up and heat it just a little bit from the back side, maybe for a three count. Because when you press from the top, the heat has to go through the wool to the, to the fusible web. It takes a little longer to get it warm. When you flip it, the fusible web is closer to the hot iron, so you don't have to press it that much. I'll be back. My beak is ironed in place. It's not peeling up. I wouldn't try to peel it up. If it was loose, I would add more heat, but it's not loose. I like to sew felted wool with fuzzy wool thread most of the time, especially on a shape this small. I don't want the thread to make a statement. I want it to blend in. So I'm using a matching shade of fuzzy thread on my wool. You can use needle threaders, but if you don't happen to have a needle threader, this is a neat trick. Toward the end of the thread, fold it over your needle. That's the eye end of the needle right there. Pull that through, pulling it up to make it fold over and then try feeding that through the loop. Very often that works. This is a Bowen number no. 9 Cruel Needle. It is my all-time favorite needle for thread that isn't very fine. I love this needle. It works with a lot of things. So, you don't need a super long length of thread. It's a small beak. If you make a knot on your thread and start right at the edge, then the tail of thread and the knot are possibly going to be visible through the fabric when it's on the background. For that reason, I like to bury the tail and the knot underneath the wool. I'm going to turn this over, and I can see where the wool is. I'm going to catch the background fabric kind of in the middle of the wool and run my needle in this case just a little ways because the beak is so small. I'm going to pull that through and where the thread will remain is between the underside of the wool and the background fabric. And I'm going to do a tiny little knot here catching the background fabric, making a loop, taking my thread bottom to top through the loop, pulling it tight. And then I can trim this off. If the beak was bigger, I would want that to be a longer tail, but my beak isn't bigger, so it can only be so long. I want to start sewing in the center of one of these lines. I left my thread close to that edge right there. I'm going to just carefully send the needle through so I can kind of spot where my thread is. And I want to come over here just a little bit more. I'm not going to do a blanket stitch here. I'm just going to do a small whip stitch. I could do a blanket stitch, but a blanket stitch is going to be a little showier than I want. I'm going to place the needle in next to the edge of the wool so that when my stitch remains, it will be perpendicular with the edge of the applique go straight down, travel from right to left under the background, and come up catching some of that edge of wool. How far your stitch goes into the wool here really depends on the weave of your wool. That is less than an eighth of an inch. And what I want to do here is make a stitch that goes here on this side, comes back up in the same place, 
and then goes out to the point and comes back up in the same place and goes this way, like a chicken foot. That is the goal. And what that will do is hold that point in place. There are times when you can turn your needle and come right back up through the origination of the stitch. Be careful not to pull your stitches too tight and also don't leave them too loose. Just keep a look on them so that you like the way they look on top. I'm going to turn this in my hand. When I make this stitch off the end of the point, it's fuzzier out there. And there are times when it makes sense to go ahead and pull your needle through to the back because turning your needle right there bends the whole end of the point. And what that can do is cause it to fray. And I really don't want it to fray. So now what I can do is send the needle back up where both of those stitches begin. Carefully pull the stitch tight. I can place my fingers bottom to top on top of that. And it feels like I might have a bit of a fuzzy thing there. Yep, I've got a little knot in my thread, so I'm glad I looked at that. I'm going to turn this in my hand. My third stitch at this point is going to go in right about there. I'm going to send the needle through. This time, when the needle comes up, it does not come up at the base of those stitches because that would put four stitches coming out of that one spot. What I'm going to do is move over to the side just a little bit and bring my needle up just like that. So it makes a nice tidy little point. Keeping your stitch width, the distance between your stitches, uniform. And the outer edge is neat. This is the outer point of the beak, and almost always it is a pointier point than the other two. There may be times where you want to do this little trick. I'll show you. I don't know that I need to do it here, but I do want to share. Sometimes, instead of doing the chicken foot, it makes more sense to just sew over the point to hold it down. If I was going to do that here, I would put my needle in so that the thread lays that way, and I would come up on the other side of the point in the cotton background fabric and I would sew over the point and here that stitch is going to be very short. I just want to hold the little fuzzy end of that point in place so I'm going to carefully choose a spot on the cotton fabric and pull that down. See how that just cinched that down nice and neat? To bring my needle up, I'm going to go back to that first stitch. Remember where it only went halfway across the beak? I'm going to bring my needle up right there and complete that stitch on the other side. So my needle will go down at the edge and then I will work my way down this second side of the point. One of the other things that the fusible web does on the back of your wool is kind of keep the edge from fraying so much. 
It doesn't work on absolutely every piece, but it works on enough of these pieces that trying the soft views is worth the effort. So here I'm getting ready to make my chicken foot. Boy, that is a cute little beak. I can go into the background. This time I'm going to turn my needle and just see how that works. Coming back up through that first hole, carefully pull the thread down. You want it to cover the point, go out to the edge, and then this stitch really completes it. I don't need to go forward because I started in the middle of this first side of the beak. That looks good. To finish, turn your work over. That is my beginning knot. I'm going to, I'm going to do this ending knot kind of close to that first knot. There's my anchor stitch. I'm bringing my thread over. I'll go ahead and turn this in my hand to find a kind of open spot for the knot. I'm only going through the background fabric here, making my knot, and then I'm going to find a way to bury that last little tail of thread underneath the applique. And I'll cut it short enough so that it doesn't extend beyond the edge of the applique. If I already had the bird body down, you would see that there's bird here. So burying that tail of thread a little longer isn't hard in most cases. But this shows you what it's like on a little bitty piece. This technique for outer points on bird beaks works here, but it also works on any other wool outer point that you run across in the entire quilt. Always remember on any of these blocks that you have options. Let yourself be creative. If you can think of a fun way to handle something using a different kind of embellishment or thread or whatever comes to mind, feel free to do so. This quilt is a really great opportunity for you to express yourself and make your very own family heirloom. I hope you enjoy the birds in Toyland, every single one of them. Thank you for watching, and may you have many happy stitches.